All right, so give me one second and we'll start. <clears throat> you ready over there, Eric? Yep, we okay. are recording. All right, very good. If you, uh, if you, I'm just going to, just so that we don't get the mouse clicks and all that stuff, I'm going to mute you. But yeah, no, just tap fine. me on the elbow and I'll just hit you. It'll be easier than you just reaching in. Um, all right, uh, here we go. You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. <laughs> Hello, patrons. Welcome to this episode of Addressing Gettysburg. Today, we are talking to another author. And this author is uh, quite accomplished. And the book that we're going to talk about today from his uh, collection of books that he's written is Gettysburg July 1. His name is David Martin. David, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. Glad to have you. Um, so couple things let's let's start with uh who you are first uh before we get into the book who is david martin and what makes him so special <laughs> <laughs> never had it couched that way um i'm a school teacher and a writer uh people ask what i do i'm a school i say school teacher and administrator i'm at the petty school which is a private high school in Hudstown, new jersey Tell you the truth, I didn't know a lot about private high schools. I grew up in Michigan uh, and went to good public schools out there. Um, went to Michigan, uh, University of Michigan undergrad, uh, got a nice scholarship to Princeton, and they sent me to go to Greece to study archaeology and Greek history, which was a lot of fun. Uh, but it's archaeology is more a hobby for rich people, as I look at it, or people that... Uh, Anyway, it's good for teaching. But anyway, I ended sure. up in teaching. There weren't college jobs available. So I got a job uh, up the road from Princeton and Heightstown at a private high school. They had always told me, don't teach at a high school. You'll never leave. And that's what happened to me. I'm in my 44th year as senior faculty member. I enjoy working with students. I do uh, what's neat with classics. I can do Greek, Latin, history, mythology, uh, general uh, humanities and cultural stuff, which is fun. Once in a while, I do lectures on the Civil War. I have done a lecture for the AP US class on what year was the turning point of the war, uh, which might be a mm, good mm. topic down the line yeah. also, because there's different ways to interpret what it means to be a turning point. Right. Uh, and certainly Gettysburg has been argued most commonly, I think, uh, along with Vicksburg to be the turning point, but I'm digressing on something else. You ask who I am. Uh, so I'm a teacher. I'm a writer, I'm a father, a grandfather now also, um, and reaching my 70s now, I'm starting to slow down a little. Uh, for a while there, I was writing almost a book a year in the 80s and 90s. Uh, now it's more like a book every three years. I have several underway that I haven't finished, but uh, that's the, the pleasure of working at a private high school. There's no publish or perish pressure um, that I can work on projects that uh, interest me. Uh, for example, I'm working on, I'm a consultant at the State Museum for New Jersey Civil War flags, uh, a flag on the 10th New Jersey Regiment, not one of your more favorite, famous ones, came on the market. So I spent three months doing research and writing up the history of the flags of the 10th New Jersey Regiment, hmm. just because that struck me at the moment and all the other projects took a back burner. Um, so uh, that's where I'm coming from. I'm still writing and active and still in reasonably good health, uh, a little bit I was uh, weary, as we all are, of the COVID vaccine crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other thing is, I haven't been to Gettysburg in seven years, and it's dri driving for me For shame, nuts. David, for shame. Yes. <laughs> um, I, I, in the, uh, during the Civil War sesquicentennial, I was on the state committee and gave lectures almost every, you know, a couple of months straight through. And we did a great program at Antietam. Uh, in, in 2012, we did one at uh, New Jersey at Gettysburg Day when I ran a tour that went to all the New Jersey monuments in one day, which I had never done before. Uh, and, but the last time I was in Gettysburg was 2014 when we did a program on New Jersey, the 14th New Jersey at Monocacy. I stayed in Gettysburg rather than Frederick. Um, and since then, I've been busy with my family and haven't gotten back there. And I was actually going to go this week until I realized, A, the, I remember the weather ain't good in yeah. Gettysburg in yeah. March. Yeah. B, the museum's only open on weekends. <laughs> Um, yeah, so well, it's so open I mean, uh, Thursday through Monday. It, it, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's closed Tuesdays and Wednesdays. 
So yeah. when the weather perks up some, I'm just going to take some vacation days. Um, I, one thing that slows me down is I'm uh, uh, head of the, the summer school here. And people say, oh, you're a teacher. You get the, school, the summers off. I said, no, I'm sorry. I work harder than ever because I'm doing double <laughs> duty. We're actually organizing it right now. Yeah. And I'm just going to tell my assistant I'm taking off going fishing for three days. You want me to use my phone number? Uh, I haven't been there, especially since they uh, uh, tore down the hotel by Lee's headquarters. I, I oh, haven't checked wow. all that out yeah. yet. And oh, I yeah, it's been a while. You, the new, you need to come back. They, the, the place changes. I mean, they, they tore down my favorite motel, which is the Home Sweet Home Motel. Uh-huh. Um, and, yes, it's improvements on the battlefield, and I need to check out what's going on. And I still haven't been through the museum. I, I miss the old museum so much because I knew where everything was. Right. <laughs> but then they, then they tore it down. And I wish I don't know if now they have more actual battle artifacts. I mean, well, I'm just no. amazed to see, like, they have they don't, uh, like the Whitworth shells that were fired from uh, Oak Hill that ended up down by Devil's Den. And well, they had all kinds of what animals. what it is is they have you know, and then the the collection is enormous, but um, what's on display is just scratching the surface of it. However, they and it's generic too. Yeah, it's yeah. it's rather generic, but they do rotate things in and out uh, of it. However, okay. the difference between uh, now and when you last came. Was that you have to pay? That and and so um, so now you have to pay to see the exhibits. But back then you didn't. But that's it. Well, I don't know if I get in free if I belong to the Friends of Gettysburg National. Oh, Park oh no! If we'll you do, then I think yeah, I think you can get in. The for last free. time I was there, I forgot it. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of annoyed me. But uh, yeah, I want to get through there. But to be honest, when when I'm at Gettysburg, I'm usually on a project. And um, I don't have time to go through the museum. I haven't right. seen the electric map or the cyclor. Electric map's not even there anymore. No, it's not I haven't there. Cyclorama yet. Cyclorama is uh, great. I, I wrote. Uh, I haven't seen that for a long time. But I did a book on New Jersey at Gettysburg, uh, and I was there. Hired a couple guides. I was there on my own, looking through the exact positions of every regiment, and wrote up a New Jersey at Gettysburg guidebook that actually won an award as best New Jersey reference book <laughs> for hmm. that year. Uh, and I wish every other state had a guidebook like that to look at specific unit positions and, and figure out where they were, where the flags were and that kind of stuff. And that was fun. But when I was there doing that research, I was very focused on getting it done. And my time when I'm at the battlefield is so precious from dawn to dusk. I don't have time to go through the museum, but this trip, I, I, I need to start at least doing section by section. Yeah. 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 Um, okay, so so uh, it, it, would you say that Gettysburg is your favorite subject in history or one of your favorites, or how does it rank up there? Uh, uh, it's probably still one. Uh, when I get tired of Gettysburg, which I do periodically, I go down to Antietam. Okay. And Antietam's neat because you can, you can walk all day and just find a few people from townspeople, especially down in the south part of Antietam. Um, there's a lot, lot there that is real neat to study, lots of regiments, uh, lots of action, lots of sources. Uh, that's why once, uh, you know, I, I, I finished strength at Gettysburg, I started a regimental strength at Antietam. It just poses a whole different set of problems researching that, and we can get into that in another program. But Gettysburg being fought on July 1st, they had just done muster rolls for pay the day before, mm. and there's all these records to dig out in the archives. For Antietam being fought in the middle of September, it's a totally different route. I had to go into newspaper articles uh, bo- um, after battle, and there's a lot of good Confederate newspaper articles that have, haven't been tapped. Mm. Uh, anyway, different set of problems. So, and then my third area is Monmouth Battlefield because oh, I yeah. live eight miles from Monmouth Battlefield, and that's one reason I haven't been going as much to Gettysburg because it's a three-hour drive. I live 20 minutes, you know, 15 minutes from Monmouth. Right. I'm president of the Friends of the Battlefield. I'm helping them do original research. Uh, um, Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr were both there. They were both wounded. There's a lot of neat stuff there, and it is you know it's a it's a known battle. It's just not one of the top ones on everybody's uh, uh, tip of their tongues. And I'm working very closely with the historian there, and it's neat to be you know one of the country's experts on the Battle of Monmouth. But it's just because I go there all the time. I give tours and stuff like that. So the, my three top would be Gettysburg. Uh, Antietam and, and Monmouth, but that's all military history. Yes. 
Yeah, I grew up in uh, New Jersey, and uh, I, I'm ashamed to say I have never been to Monmouth. But uh, oh, I, yeah. well, well, then you, oh, yeah. Well, you need to rectify that, or if you're going to come, give me a call, and I'll give you a tour. Oh, out there, absolutely, uh, I would love it. Yeah, no, I mean, when I come back to visit sometime, I am going to make time because my mother doesn't live too far. Well, actually. I have my mother's down by the beach, and my father's still up north. My sister's still up north, and neither one of them is too far a drive from Monmouth. So, uh, yeah, it, there's well, really that's what's no nice excuse. in New Jersey. You're never more than an hour and a half from anywhere in New Jersey. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so Gettysburg, July one. Uh, what made you decide to do uh, a book about July first? What year did this come out, by the way? Okay, it came out, I think it was 95. 95, I've got okay. a copy here. So um, this was before, was this, this was yeah, before Fonts? Yeah. This was before yeah. the Fonts book, right? Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, and what, uh, well, okay, well, I'll talk about the books first and then go back and what, what got me going on it. But, sure. Um, well, maybe not. Okay, um, I grew up in Michigan, and my great-grandfather was in a Michigan battery, the 8th Michigan battery. But I was, my favorite regiment, was the 24th Michigan, which, as you know, is a key part on the first day. Right. Um, and I developed a liking, Lord knows why, for General Reynolds. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're both on the first day. And um, there wasn't any monograph on the first day out except uh, Hassler's book that came out, I think, in 88. Uh, that everybody, it was just like a prelude to the main battle. And, and nobody was paying a lot of detailed attention to what was going on there and you're saying so you're saying right, hassler with an a not hessler with an e hassler yeah yeah warren hassler okay. h-a-s-s-l-e-r okay. in 88 uh university of alabama mm -hmm. um and i was writing um okay well long story um i got into liking civil war because i was a teenager when the centennial came up i'm a little bit older than you i don't think you were around when the centennial was here <laughs> no uh, but I used to get for Christmas the a company called Marx, M A R X, like the Marx Brothers, mm -hmm. did soldier sets. One was the Revolution, which I liked. One was the Alamo, which I really liked, and one was the Civil War blue and gray set. So I had all these toy soldiers, and I used to play, you know, play whatever. But then I started got the idea of redoing battles. So I actually did in 1963 when I was 14 years old. Um, I researched the battle. I took a, one of the rooms or half of our basement and made a battlefield out of paper mache and, and trees and houses and roads and everything. Uh, got the order of the battle out of battles and leaders of the Civil War. Uh, had enough soldiers that I could make uh, regiments a, a ratio of one for every 300. I had a cannon for every battery. And I just researched the battle from end, end, beginning to end and refought it with the toy soldiers exactly 100 years later, <laughs> uh, which was cool. Yeah, uh, and uh, I put that stuff away when I, actually I also did Antietam in Chancellorsville, <laughs> just for the heck of it. Sure, um, why not? Later on, and so I went off to University of Michigan to uh, to uh, study military history, and I took a course as a uh, I took a graduate course in the Revolution when I was a freshman in college, and I got an A plus in it, and they didn't know what to do with me. Uh, and it was also the day of days of Vietnam. So I ended up because my uh, advisor was a Greek teacher and I had a free course freshman year. He talked me into taking Greek instead of economics. And it was cool and different uh, and really different. Hmm. So I started studying Greek and they gave me a scholarship to go to Rome and I ended up being a classics major. But I still enjoy American history, especially military history. Went to Princeton, got a scholarship to study archaeology in Greece and was all ready to teach classics when I finished, but um, there weren't any jobs. Although we used to say, <laughs> pardon the French, where there's death, there's hope. You know, you'd really you know read the read the newspapers to see you know any Latin teachers die anywhere that I got make a job opening. Well, there wasn't, <laughs> so I, I ended up I, that really worked for a friend of mine who taught math. There was a car uh, one of. Uh, an accident over near Princeton where a teacher was killed. And he said, Oh my God, let it be a math teacher. And it was, and oh, he got his Jesus. job. <laughs> so where there's death, there's hope. Um, so I couldn't get a uh, college job. So I ended up at, a, at the high school, uh, the petty school in Heightstown, New Jersey. Uh -huh. And I enjoy working with 
students and teaching Latin, and I consider myself a wordsmith, which a lot of the, the way I teach Latin is cognate vocabulary and grammar. But then I got, uh, that was the era when war games were popular. So um, I got, there's a game ter- called Terrible Swiss Sword, which you may have heard mm-hmm. about by Rich Berg. And uh, he, um, it's a regimental level game with complicated rules and using historical maps. And it was really cool. So I used to play it by myself or play it with my friends. And that reintroduced my interest to Gettysburg uh, in the late seventies to start going back. Um, Especially when I wrote uh, Rich Berg and he had the 24th Michigan as a unit with 300 men. Okay. And everybody knows the 24th Michigan had 496 men, right? Okay. (laughs) So I said, look, you got your numbers wrong. And he said, yeah, sure, kid. So I got all my research notes together from when I was 13 and went back and did him an old B on Gettysburg that had better strengths. And I ended up being a consultant to Richburg and all these war games they did on Shiloh and Antietam or whatnot for uh, SBI simulations publications in New York. And once I was doing their OB research, I started writing for their magazine, Strategy and Tactics. And I remember how excited I was when I got my first article published. And it was on the Terrible Swiss Sword game comparing history with gaming. Um, So uh, that got me back interested in gaming, specifically Gettysburg. So I was writing for SPI for quite a while. And they, they hooked me up because I had done an article on Jackson's Valley campaign with Bob Pigeon from Combined Books in Philadelphia, and he was starting a series of great campaigns of the Civil War, the monographs, 192 pages each, and the first one I did for him was on Jackson's Valley Campaign, and that went so well that I was doing others, and I I have trouble even rattling them all off, but I've done uh, uh, Shiloh, Peninsula, Uh, I did one on Monmouth for them, Chancellorsville, I can't remember them all. so uh, what I proposed to him was that why don't we – a friend of mine, Al Nofi, had done a one-volume, 192-page Gettysburg book. And I said, you can't do Gettysburg in 192 pages. Why no. don't we do a day one and then a day two and a day three, each at 192 pages? And that's what I proposed to do. And he countered back to me and said – why don't you just do July 1, because there's nothing much out there except the Hassler book, uh, and write everything you want. Mm. And I said, well, okay. Uh, and this was quite a change from the campaign books I was doing, which were 192 pages, can format, lots of pictures, no footnotes. Mm. And so I wrote July 1, uh, because it was there, and I said I had already had the interest in July 1 because of the 24th Michigan and General Reynolds. Um, I'm not a Buford fan, but we can get into that later in the talk uh, as much as everybody else. Uh, and ended up with uh, you know 2,500 footnotes and no pictures except the one on the cover and a lot of maps. Um, so he just gave me free reign to write as much as I wanted on July 1. And, and that came out in 95. Ironically, um, a fellow, Gene Shu did a book called Morning at Willoughby Run, which was the morning part of the first day. Yeah, yeah, came out yeah. exactly the same time as mine. And, uh, and then in 2001 or thereabouts, Harry Fonz did a July one, which to be honest, I haven't read. Uh, it's more an operational uh, book. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I love everything Fonz wrote. And if you were to ask me or I get polled every once in a while, you know, what my favorite book on the Civil War is, which is another topic or be happy to contribute to probably the footnotes to Coddington's Gettysburg campaign. But my second favorite <laughs> Civil War book is uh, Cemetery Hill and Culp's Hill by Harry Fonz. Okay. Because he tells a lot of detail on something people really haven't looked at before with alternate versions. And because of my training as a classicist um, on rebuilding ancient history and my work in Latin and Greek with language, I, I'd like to you know, look at and evaluate all the sources. And what's happening, like with John Burns on July 1, if you have two or three sources, you can weave them together to make a narrative. Hmm. But what happens with Gettysburg, when you start getting eight or ten sources, they start con- conflicting with each other. Right. And you have to evaluate them. Now, a lot of the a lot of the history books will just you know 
summer or just give a version of what's going on and maybe put the other sources or not in a footnote. What I did in July one, and that's why I asked you to look at the death of Reynolds section yeah. was to go through all the sources and all the claimants. There's like eight or 10 stories there yep. on how did Reynolds die? Who shot him? What happened? And weigh each one because they're all different versions or they fall into groups. Was it artillery? Was it friendly fire? Was it Confederates from the West, Confederates from the North, whatever, and weigh that all through. And that takes like 10 pages of the book to discuss. Yeah. But then you get a better feel, feel for what's going on in the battle. And in, in that case, you come to a conclusion, uh, you know, what's likely to have happened. And my belief is still, it wasn't a sharpshooter. And in, in, of certain specific Confederate sharpshooters claiming to have done it, there was too much smoke, and it, he's on the other side of the woods. Yeah, I mean, how can you can't? You, there's no line that what they call line of sight from Hers Ridge over to or wherever they were uh, into that corner of um, uh, of, of Herbst Woods. Uh, that it was probably just an overshot from one of the from Davis's brigade. But I come to my opinion now. You people may feel differently. Uh, the next generation, or there might be more evidence that comes up. But I do that throughout the book, and I mentioned John Burns uh, as a local hero like Jenny Wade, except he's the first day hero. Uh, and he does seem to have fought with two or three different regiments. It's a really, really neat story with multiple levels to it. But you need to get into what's called source criticism. And that's what I was trained at at Princeton and Classics, because when you look at what happened with Julius Caesar or Nero or somebody, you need to be aware that we only have like 20% of the ancient sources. Right. And we're trying to weave together ancient history based on 20% of the sources. And you've got some statues, you may have a painting, you've got uh, sources by a, guy named, a historian named Suetonius who didn't like emperors at all. You have to weigh the sources, look at the biases of the sources. Uh, when you're looking at, I mean, when I was young, when you're reading Gettysburg, I remember when I discovered the official records of the Civil War, and I was like 12. <laughs> they weren't available in my town. They were in Flint, which was an hour away. And I went down and, and read them and copied them, took notes and thought they were God's gift to the world <laughs> until I figured out at about age 25, you got to see who's writing mm -hmm. the report. When are they writing it? What axes do they have to grind? Mm -hmm. And you have to weigh the sources. So you're all the time citing official records as a source, but you got to also evaluate them. So that's what my training as a classicist was, was to collect sources and evaluate them. Well, let's go and back that, to... I've applied, that, I've applied that training to this, and that's also what I did with Renjim Reynolds' strength at Gettysburg. Yes, go back to... Well, let's go back to uh, the death of General Reynolds, because that was one of the parts you suggest we read, and I read it. And uh, I, I agree with your conclusion, um, and, but why don't we talk about, uh, from what you can remember, if, if you're doing this off the top of your head, um, what the different... Uh, accounts were, I mean, some of the ones, you know, coming from the 55th North Carolina and, and, uh, I think there were two from, from that regiment, if I'm not mistaken, or one that you surmised uh, was from that regiment. And the other one actually was, is that right? Yeah. I mean, just to set, set the scene, um, general Reynolds was the wing commander, uh, first, third and 11th Corps, coming on the field around 10 o'clock on the morning. Um, by the way, uh, there was this common story that Reynolds had been offered command of the army before Meade was. I mm. still haven't nailed that down. I don't know if I'm 100% behind that. Uh, it's more to glorify him. Uh, he's the highest ranking, uh, you know, un off union officer killed at the battle. Um, and that's there. And I haven't seen what the current studies are. I don't know if there's any articles in Gettysburg Magazine or somewhere. That's where the current, um, so my my understanding got, was always uh, that um, he had a meeting with Lincoln, but no actual record of that meeting exists. And people, historians, yeah. have concluded that possibly the command of the army uh, was discussed and Reynolds demurred because uh, Washington meddles too much. But nobody knows for sure. But I think over the yeah. years it has been presented as that was definitely what it was. Uh, yeah, that's the common belief. Again, I, yeah. I couldn't nail it down 100%, but that's the common yeah. story. So uh, the question is, you know, what 
is a wing commander doing posting a regiment, the 2nd Wisconsin, mm. uh, at a holding action. Uh, that's just the kind of leader he was. And unfortunately, aggressive leaders like Stonewall Jackson, who lead from the front, end up being the battle casualties. <laughs> yeah. Whereas those like General Meade, who leads from the back, which is maybe where the – that's where I would be anyway, where a leader ought to be, uh, don't get – or Meade was actually wounded earlier in the war. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. So when Reynolds is posting this, uh, the regiment there on the edge of Herbst Woods, there's different versions of um, uh, from like three or four different Confederate regiments. And there were sharpshooters around. And what people don't realize so much, I mean, Lee had they had, were sharpshooter battalions earlier in the war, and some came out after Gettysburg. And what's interesting, uh, when I did my uh, regimental strengths and losses at Gettysburg book, uh, you would think that the order of battle would be fully set for something as famous and studied as Gettysburg. Hmm. But everybody tend to have followed what's either in battles and leaders or in the official records. Turns out there was a third Georgia battalion of Confederate sharp sharpshooters in Wofford's brigade that had never been listed in anybody's OBs. Hmm. <laughs> And I, I found battle casualties and then eventually found their muster rolls, a strength of almost 200. But mm -hmm. Wofford didn't uh, write a full report. But again, when we talk about that, hopefully on another session, when I did the regimental strengths and losses, I was also nailing down the order of battle because not every regiment had 10 companies. Right. Some, some were on detached duty. Some regiments never had a company be in the first place. Uh, it just really, really uh, opens your eyes uh, on you know, why you don't, shouldn't accept what's been taken as gospel. It needs to be re-researched mm. every generation mm. or so. Mm. Uh, so uh, there were in some of the regiments, especially North Carolina, a designated sharpshooter or two, uh, different than the guys that are on skirmishers, because when they send out a skirmish line, they just grab a company and say, you, go out, you guys go right. out and be skirmishers. But there are designated sharpshooters and that one of those stories I, you know, I told in there, uh, who would be available, uh, and the general would say, or their commander, colonel would say, there's a guy on a horse over there. Why don't you take care of him? And when I, it's interesting, when I give my tours at Monmouth, I always say, if you're an American uh, continental infantryman and you see anybody in British in red uniform on a horse, shoot him. Because he's either a general, a colonel, or a an aide delivering messages, <laughs> any one of which will be to our advantage to take out of action. Now, it, at least in the Revolution, it wasn't thought to be gentlemanly mm. uh, to uh, shoot, because uh, we shot uh, what the main Confederate general at Saratoga, which is the reason we won Saratoga, is a sharpshooter took out the Confederate general. Or sorry, the, oh, the, uh, the British, British general. Yeah. Yeah, but, uh, by the time of the Civil War, that's not a problem, although specific sharpshooters taking out specific generals, um, you know, other than what happened on Little Round Top, where, the, you know, the story is coming out of Devil's Den, um, and they got you know, Hazlitt and Weed on consecutive shots almost. Um, there are stories there. Now, the problem is you have to go and check out the, the line of sight. And I... Uh, that, you know, there's so much smoke there, and Reynolds is at the corner, the southwest corner of Herbst Woods. I don't think there's a line of sight, and I mentioned that in the book, from where these different sharpshooters claimed they were. And there's also a question, uh, there's Lieutenant Colonel Callis. There are other officers around riding horses. Mm. And in, in all the smoke and confusion, if you happen to do shoot somebody on the other side on a horse, how do you know who it was? Yeah, uh, it, You don't. And people start five, six years after the war saying, well, I did this, I did that. You just don't know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and it, but it turned out with some of those Confederate accounts, it wasn't you know, them jumping up and down or wanting a medal to do it. And that's what's interesting about our Civil War is that how readily afterwards we accepted the opposition. And, uh, you know, I, I, not to get political, but just I've been thinking about this. I mean, if you went to D-Day, which I haven't done yet. It's on my bucket list. Yeah, and there were all kinds of monuments there to the different German regiments. Well, how would you feel? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the the difference is that they were no. always foreigners, and I think that's that's yeah. why why Americans have yeah. a hard time uh, grappling and, with that whole thing. 
yeah, uh, and General Wheeler was leading American troops, uh, Confederate cavalry officer down right. in, in, uh, in the in, Spanish American uh, War. Spanish American War, and it grates me. And uh, you know, I don't know what your stance on this, and I shouldn't be getting political. But when uh, I read in Civil War news or something that there's movements out there, there are still 1,600 Confederate type monuments on the bat on the battlefields and in the Confederate towns, and they want and certain people want them all taken down. And our stance is at least the sons of Union veterans in the Civil War and that they were, uh, in order to understand the battle correctly, you need those markers up there for the regiments and what brigades were where. Yeah. And, I always say, what good uh, is Batman without the Joker? Like, you need to have yeah. something. And also just to help, you know, put troop placements and things like that in mind. And the problem I have, uh, and it's a very, I don't know what my stance is because I, I take it on a case by case basis because they're not all the same. Um, what's in a town is not the same as what's on a battlefield. Um, I can, I or can, cemetery. or yeah. a cemetery. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, I mean, you gotta, it's very complicated. Um, I, I don't think, uh, anything glorifying, an enemy of the United States, no matter who that enemy is. And, and I might extend yeah. that to crazy horse, even though, you know, I think that, the, yeah. I think that they got a, a bad deal for sure. I am actually kind of a little somewhat more sympathetic to the native uh, Americans uh, in some cases, in most cases probably. But uh, if we're, if we're going to be tearing down things uh, that are erected to what were once enemies of the United States, regardless of what we feel about them today, um, then they all got to come down. So but how, how scary to see. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't, yeah, I also, uh, I don't, but yeah, I, I don't have a problem with crazy horse. See, that's the thing is I don't have a problem with crazy horse having a monument because it is something that commemorates a past event that is no longer. And, and someone who was a big part of mm -hmm. that and whether he was on our side or the other side, it shaped our history. It shaped who we are today. Yeah. Um, it's just glorifying certain people or ideologies. That's where you get it gets tricky. Uh, so yeah. I don't know. I'm all over the place on this. Yeah. One. So probably spending too much time on this, but I could see you know removing Confederate flags off the metal markers at sure. Gettysburg. If they have to take the Confederate monuments down, then have a little park area where you can see them all because there are. It's uh, Gettysburg is a great outdoor artistic sculpture garden yeah um but it's just when certain groups or certain individuals start making noise about it and i could see you know that that uh, road in richmond where every uh, statues of general lee and jefferson davis and everybody except arthur ash came down um <laughs> it's in different times now yeah. um Anyway, we're digressing from where we were. So we're talking about the death of General Reynolds. Right. Uh, so what I did in the book was to go through the different versions. Uh, General Heath thought it was one of the um, one of his cannons uh, mm -hmm. that had uh, taken him out, but we know that he was killed by a musket ball. Uh, a couple of the sharpshooter accounts mentioned shooting a Union officer on a horse posting a battery. Well, mm -hmm. Reynolds was not posting a battery at the time, so that eliminates those. Um, and uh, that's why I came down, uh, and again, I talked about the, uh, the, the smoke in the line of sight, that I think it was just an overshot either from Archer's Brigade, which was quickly driven out of the woods, or even from um, uh, Davis's Brigade, which is north of the railroad cut. It was just a str I'm just saying it was a straight, probably a straight shot. Uh, you, um, so in other well, words, they, he wasn't targeted. Um, but you, you do point out, though, that uh, he wasn't the only one. So... For those people that don't know, it wasn't like Reynolds was there all alone. Reynolds was surrounded by his staff, correct? Yeah, and yeah, and what uh, kept one of, the, one of the staff members' horse went down, and right. a couple guys got wounded. Kind of like when Jackson was shot exactly. at, uh, at Chancellorsville. Uh, there's a list now; six or eight guys got hit. It's terrible because there were like two volleys, mm -hmm. uh, but that was friendly fire. Um, that's been that's been conclusively proved for for the, Jackson. The you're story. talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, but but Reynolds with, was with him, yeah. You, you placed Reynolds according to one of the second Wisconsin boys. Uh, Reynolds was to the right rear of uh, to the right wing. Yeah, yeah. 
of the second Wisconsin. And, uh, and I accept that. And that's part of that, of reading through all the sources and seeing what might be the more reasonable one. Mm-hmm. But what, what my philosophy was in presenting all the alternate versions is to let the reader do their own picking. And I say, I'm not selective. Uh, I'm including all the sources I have. Right. I may be biased in the order I present them or the conclusion I come to, or even how I group them. But all the sources are here. If you want to believe otherwise, having been through all these sources, and I may, you know, 20 years later have changed my mind. I mm-hmm. haven't on this one, but once in a while, uh, you know, you're, you know, you're permitted. And where that really comes out is I, I uh, wrote a book on Molly Pitcher at Monmouth, mm. who's a living, who's a legend, but also apparently a historical personage. But that has been a bear to try to prove because all the sources just aren't there. Interesting. Um, and I change my mind a little bit once in a while about what's what, but having researched all the sources and being annoyed at the way everybody just keeps blindly repeating each other <laughs> rather than looking back to the original sources. And I had dug up some original sources that nobody had really looked at before and integrated what her movements were supposed to be versus some sources that I had found to make that work that it seems that she was a, a woman, uh, Mary Hayes McCauley was really there and how that worked. But you have to look at the source work, and that also goes back, as I mentioned, to my training as a classicist, which is interpreting ancient events when you only got 20% of the sources and trying to make a logic out of them. Um, So anyway, the death of Reynolds is one of the key points of the battle, uh, but it's also one of the more controversial ones. I had also mentioned John Burns is a neat story. Uh, He was such a local hero, uh, that he had fed on that. He got to meet Lincoln when Lincoln came to uh, give the uh, Gettysburg Address, as you know. Uh, and several accounts with Burns want to mention him just because he was famous and they want to get included in the bandwagon, I guess. Uh, there were a couple other, uh, apparently, you know, local locals that were wandering the field, but clearly the neatest story is him. And once you piece the right piece it together, apparently he was with three different regiments during the course of the day. Apparently he was wounded and lay on the battlefield overnight till, till he literally crawled to the doorstep of one of his neighbors. Uh, it's just a really, really neat story of bravery. And these battles are all about individuals. Mm-hmm. And I tend to get, uh, consumed by talking about the 24th Michigan. Well, the 24th Michigan is a construct. It's, it's, it's a bunch of people, but not. it doesn't have an existence of its own. Mm. It's all these individuals that each have stories. Uh, and that's why I really like, uh, like the section I did on uh, the Union retreat through the town. Uh, officers who had been wounded earlier in the day were being taken care of in the houses. They're getting captured. People are getting lost. What was it like to be there then? If you're coming out, especially the right wing of the first corps, trying to retreat through the town with the 11th corps there, Confederates all over the place, and just the sheer mayhem of what was going on then is just mind boggling. Yeah, sure. Um, and when you're going through that, you can you know kind of trace individual Confederate regiments because some, especially from Perrin's Brigade, which is the first one to get into town because uh, they had broken the Union line south of the seminary, they, uh, they, one regiment went in and was afraid of getting cut off in town and pulled back. Another regiment went in. They came back. Uh, one of Daniel's uh, regiments, I think it was maybe it was Ramsor, came in on the railroad line and came in. Um, a bunch of Union uh, troops holed up. Uh, you know the story of the uh, Chaplain Howell was accidentally shot on the front of the Lutheran sure, church steps. Sure. And uh, I hadn't been aware of the Eagle Hotel. Almost the whole Union regiment holed up in the Eagle Hotel until they finally surrendered. Uh, it's just the stories that were Sergeant Humiston. There's just a lot of neat stories of individuals. Uh, and what well, General Schimmelfennig, who had, had hid in the backyard in somebody's um, uh, pigsty or something for the rest of Well, the and there's time. also that uh, story uh, from, I think, the 76 New York of uh, a woman uh, handing out water whose uh, heart was pierced by a bullet and she died. And um, that shot, might be, yeah, yeah it might uh, be confused with Jenny Wade. Yeah, uh, and there were, uh, I mean, there's a story of a, of, a, of a kid that picked up an artillery shell and got, blew himself up after the battle. Mm, there yeah. were others 
around. It's just they got most of the uh, the uh, press on that. But what's interesting is, uh, I'm but so there, sorry there wasn't there wasn't magazine. another. Yeah, sorry to yeah. interrupt you. There wasn't another yeah. woman who died during the battle. So this there's this account in there from the 76 yeah. New York from during the retreat. But you, yeah, and I don't. You say it's probably. I, I don't remember confused. that her name. Yeah, I don't remember if I even gave her name. She even, no. Apparently, she's a nameless yeah. heroine. Is the is the term? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so anyway, what, what I started to say was, I'm sorry, Blue and Gray magazine has gone out of, of print because they were just so great with their tours and detailed battles. And mm. in one of their in, in the last year or so, I got a call uh, from uh, Dave Roth to do Gettysburg the town fight, and that's what I'm really. I, you know, one of the aspects they like I include in the uh, the July one book is how the townspeople reacted when the troops, Union troops, came through the town during the morning to go up to the front, mm-hmm. when they're retreating back through the town, when they're taking care of the wounded, when they're being occupied by the Confederates, uh, the the Confederate sharpshooters that were up there for two days, uh, and all the fighting that was going on just below or just north of uh, Cemetery Hill, um, and then the Jenny Wade story in that. So that, I'm very you know, very half that was on my bucket list to be able to, uh, you know, uh, put an article out for Blue and Gray anyway. Uh, that what's there, I'm looking possibly, looking more and more probable to retire to Gettysburg in a couple of years. There you go. And one thing I might want to do is, uh, you know, help out with the Adams County Historical Society, which is where I, I'm sure they can use some volunteer help and, you know, learn sure. what it was like to be, um, to be living there. You know, every Every barn within five miles of the battlefield was a hospital for one side or the other. Um, you know, what I, I read more and more about what the battlefield was like in the months after the battle mm. with all the wounded, all the dead horses, all the burials. Um, it was more than just, it was a three day whirlwind that swept through town that affected it all the way to expect, it affected the town of Gettysburg all the way till today. Yeah. Um, and you have to have respect for it as a battlefield rather than as a tourist place. I mean, I, when I was younger, I used to also take my, or take my son up to Cooperstown to the Baseball Hall of Fame. And to us, with all the ice cream and fudge places, it was, you know, you know Gettysburg on a lake. You know, neat things to go see. And it's up there, it's baseball. And at Gettysburg, it's battles. Yeah. Um, but uh, you have to respect what the suffering and the hurt that went on there. Um, anyway, I just... I, I ca- but I'm getting close. close I wish to that, the yeah. the government would uh, change the word park in the name Gettysburg National Military Park, change it to memorial yeah. or something like that, because uh, the modern American is not taught the the value of this place, the importance of this place, and um, the, I, I think even the word memorial is 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 lost on most people today. But at least if you throw that word in there. Maybe yeah. people would not treat it like it's just your typical recreation park at the end of a cul-de-sac in a in a uh, neighborhood, um, you know, in the suburbs. Yeah, that's a, a great point. I, I'm struggling to see what you would use. I mean, I again volunteer every weekend. Have for 20 years at Monmouth Battlefield State Park. Yeah, and what we have there is a green area. We have hikers. We have Boy Scouts. We have bird watchers. We have tree huggers. <laughs> and we have historians. The reason for having the park is it was a battlefield, but it's multi-use. Right. But Gettysburg is more than that. Yes. Um, but I don't know what term might work. I have to wait, wait memorial. Up to it's just a giant yeah. six thousand yeah. acre memorial. I mean, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, it's got to it's got to be a word that its meaning can't be confused. Park. Yeah, people um, hear that word and they think of different things. You know, everybody has a different well, idea of what a called? park. What was it called? Because originally the originally the War Department managed it before it got turned over to the National Park System in the right thirties or whatever that was. What did they call it back then? Eric, huh. do, you, do you know what this was? Wasn't it? Uh, it? It was like a memorial something, wasn't it? It was no, it wasn't. It wasn't. Um, no, it was always a military battle, park. Ba- ba- battle, uh, national battlefield, maybe. Na- I, I have they used no, to, it, in so, the 1890s so, or so. Antietam they is reports annual reports. Yeah, Antietam's a national battlefield. Gettysburg, I don't think was ever a national battlefield. I think it was always no, no, no. But he's saying when it was in private hands, when it was not in the government's hands. Uh, oh, I don't yeah, know. If, General Crawford had bought the uh, the, the wheat field area. 
yeah. and different individuals that, were keeping it, and then that got consolidated under the war department. Well, there, that, there was the, the Gettysburg Force, Battlefield yeah. Memorial Association. That was the organization. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah when, when, the, when the GBMA yeah. owned it, but I don't know that they ever called it anything other than a park. I don't know either. I'm not sure what the GBMA called it. I feel like well, there I'm was... Sure yeah, go ahead. We can look that up for your listeners. We'll get uh, come back to you with that. But uh, uh, you're right in that. I wish it weren't called a park. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think originally it was a good idea because you know people. Um, well, maybe I'm I'm being unfair to modern Americans, but I'm. I have a feeling that enough. Americans in the olden days had uh, a certain level of respect for certain things, and they understood that even though you call it a park, you, it's not a place where you go and uh, have fun. Although you, you look at all the things that they did have here um, on yep. what we call sacred ground today, the so maybe and everything yeah, yeah, the trolley, <laughs> hotels, uh, amusement parks, Sports maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Maybe I maybe I'm full of it. Uh you know, maybe they're they're people have always been s- stupid and classless. <laughs> I, I don't know. But I I just I think now more than ever it's just there's the, the, you know, our I don't know. I think our culture is just completely gone and we need I mean, to just yeah. dumb it down for I, everybody. Uh, honestly, in my opinion, I shouldn't even call it a memorial. Just go back to calling it a national battle or go to calling it a national battlefield. It 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 yeah. gives a different connotation than than park does. Yeah. And do you think is the military planning on using it for tank exercises no. ever again? Or <laughs> not likely? Yeah. So <laughs> let's maybe we should you know redesignate it. Uh, of course, that's probably like a thirty-five year process to <laughs> to go through <laughs> to make that happen. Should be pretty easy, but of course it's not. Um, the The other thing about uh, the book July One that I really like, and 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 this is I think very important uh, in understanding any battle. Um, But since we're talking about Gettysburg, obviously here, it's Appendix 3. You have several appendices, and Appendix 3 is topographical. And you talk about the roads, the ridges, the hills, all of these things. They play a huge role in the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, They're the reason for the season. I mean, it's it's the reason everything happens the way it does. No? Um, Yeah, and it's... I mean, everybody talks about the uh, 10 or 11 or 12, depending on, on how you count them, uh, number of road uh, roads that meet there at Gettysburg. But I, I do point out, even in the introduction, that that decisive battle of that campaign could have happened anywhere between Frederick, Maryland, and New York. Because right. those towns also have roads that come together. Why they it specifically happened at Gettysburg uh, was from some decisions that uh, General Buford and um, – made and strange one that general hill made on the 30th Pettigrew should should have had that town on the 30th um uh, and um uh, but they always say you know the road network and then i list all the roads but then what's the impact what were the roads like okay they weren't turnpikes hmm. and the key to that with the road network is yes there's a railroad line there but it wasn't of good use then although lincoln was able to bring it in but the railroad west of town wasn't even finished that's why you get the railroad cuts that figure in the first day's battle right uh and there was coming in from the other way but the main problem and this is maybe actually why lee lost the battle is his main access for two-thirds of his army is the chambersburg pike or the cash town cash town pike and he's got, he had t- whole divisions. He had that whole road backed up with troops hmm. from about noon on July 1 until noon the next day. Anderson's division could have been on the field, except it's backed up on the pike. Uh, and what's interesting is like the, the, the Third Corps artillery was clogging up the road. Yeah. And Pickett's division could have been on the field on the first day, except all these Confederate troops are kind of trying to come through Cashtown Pass on that one road. Yeah. If there had been other parallel roads coming in, or if they knew what was going on, they could have sent some troops down to Fairfield, a little bit longer march, but bring them in that way. Um, that That is a severe impact on the battle, that the road network helped uh, the battle happen. But it hindered the Confederates, whereas on the Union side, because Meade had spread his troops out with having the Third Corps over at Ensburg and you know the Second Corps down in Tawny Town and then Sixth Corps over in Manchester somewhere, they're coming in all on separate roads. So they all got to the battlefield quicker. Right, right. And that, you know, need, that needs to be evaluated when you're looking at the road network. 
which is part of the topographical history. And also Reynolds uh, very uh, wisely uh, ordered um, Howard. When Howard told him in the morning, hey, I'm heading to Gettysburg, um, and he even mentions that he's got his uh, wagons intermingled, Reynolds writes back to him and says, no, put them in the back. The infantry gets right of way. So he knew, let's not gum up the works. Let's just get the troops to where they need to be. Yeah. Uh, the Confederates yep. don't seem they they're kind of going around a little more blind. Um, I mean, uh, obviously. Yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah. Talking about being blind, I mean, Lee's always or Stewart's always criticized for not being on the battlefield through a misunderstanding of orders or whatever. Lee's let him do, but Stewart only had four brigades with him. Lee had access to three brigades of cavalry. Yeah. But they weren't there with him at the critical moment on the morning, either the 30th or the morning yep. first day, and he lets, lets Heath lead the advance, which is a new division. And he leads the advance with, da- with Archer's Brigade, which was under strength, and Davis's, which is a political appointee. Uh, and they just get really messed up because they don't have their best leaders there. I mean, one of the what-ifs that I discuss elsewhere in the book, what if Stonewall Jackson had been there? Well, if Jackson had been there, Hill's division, would it, Light Division, would never have been broken up. Yeah. And ja- what if Jackson was there with Hill's Light Division on the morning of the first day? You know, they, they would have been on Cemetery Hill by noon. Perhaps, or perhaps um, they never would have ever met at Gettysburg. Or, yeah, or they wouldn't even have met, met there. But, yeah. And, you know, that gets into, you know, why didn't the Confederates try to take Cemetery Hill at the end of the day, which I have a discussion of at the end of the book. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, they blame Ewell and for Lee being too lackada- lackadaisical and take the hill if you can. Um, and just everybody deferred to everybody else. They were tired out. They're exhausted. There were, a lot of U- there were a lot of Union troops coming on the field. And what's interesting is I had played that out with miniatures. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I found, and I made it work one time when I was the Confederates. If uh, you're familiar with Stevens Knoll, I, yes, I trust. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. If if Ewell had, uh, or sorry, if Early had attacked with Hayes' brigade on Stevens Knoll, that was the point that would have broke the line. But that's just, you know that's like that's Monday morning quarterbacking. Mm. But I did get it to work by having a charge right there. You get up the the right flank then of, of Cemetery Hill. You have uh, woods cover on on the uh, to the um, uh, to the left as you're making the attack. Right, right. But anyway, I, I made I in miniatures won the battle <laughs> by having a late attack on <laughs> Stevens Knoll. Uh, but well, you, you don't know until you try it. You yeah. bring up uh, Stewart and the cavalry, and one of the points that we often try to ram home to people to our listeners um, and Tim Smith, uh, you know Tim Smith, of course. He uh, yeah he's uh, he all, often brings this up and that is that uh lee it's not that lee didn't have cavalry it's that he didn't use the cavalry he had and i i the the, here's something i i talked about with noah uh andre trudeau uh in his interview and that is the lost cause religion um how how do you I mean, you're going to encounter it as you as you go through different sources and things. What do you do when you when it's like obvious that whatever you're reading is is lost cause propaganda and not a lot of history? How do you sift through it? Do you present it or do you just completely throw it out whole cloth or what do you do? Um, if I'm writing a book like this, I might bring it up. I haven't been uh, an advocate of that. Uh, yes, Stuart's a war hero because he died in battle in '64, uh, and uh, I haven't been part of the pro-Virginia clan. Of, of you know, if you weren't a general from Virginia, you weren't one of the best generals. Right. I.e., Longstreet, uh, which is I happen to name my company Longstreet right. House because my silent partner is a Longstreet. Uh, oh, neat. But um, you, you, you always want to kind of you know support the underdog. There's more to the war going on than just. Uh, just Virginia, um, that I mean, it, I, I try to stay clear of it because I'm interested in what happened on the field with the individual soldiers. I said, mm-hmm. and put the footnotes down. I, I'm not real good on, uh, you know, overarching, uh, theory or interpretation of the war afterwards. And Longstreet certainly had a handle in all that, uh, you know, becoming a, 
turncoat Republican when he took his uh, <laughs> the job he got after the war. Right. Um, uh, and but there, there's a certain set of heroes. And now the question: Do you include Pickett in that or not? Because there's a Pickett Lee break uh, that happened. Right. Um, right. But uh, I, you know, Sidney Johnston was a great general. Um, you know, Lee wasn't maybe the best general, Confederate general in the war when you look at it. Um, but those things are fun to debate. Um, I, I've, I've given a talk which is, you know, ranking or evaluating the Union Corps commanders at Gettysburg. You know, who did a good job, who didn't, who did the best job, uh, who has the most potential. And, you know, you got to come up with Hancock, who is on the first day, by the way. Sure. Um, because he helped save the day at the end of the day. Uh, but um, they all got did other things in 64 and 64 was just awful all around on mm-hmm. both sides. I mean, the more I look into it, I'm frustrated, especially when I was working on the 10th New Jersey, the battle reports aren't, aren't all there because dang it, they were fighting for six straight weeks mm. from the wilderness down to Petersburg mm. and nobody had time to write reports <laughs> right. and they're taking losses right and left. And to try to figure out what was going on, uh, it's just a different kind. It's more World War One type of war, right? It's a mess uh, with with static lines and trenches and try to outflank and, and all that. And it just the war is so different by then. It's hard to research what was going on, and which is frustrating to me because I like to see what was going on. I was trying to work with the 10th New Jersey on where they lost battle flags right and left. Uh, just troops and the troops were with all the re, uh, all the draftees coming in and they're just everybody's getting worn worn down. And it's just it's a wonder that the war kept going that long. I mean, the South had no choice but to defend themselves and the North kept throwing troops in. Uh, but it, the big difference, and this is the talk I, uh, when I do the talk about the turning points of the war, is in many ways, well, I, I can argue for 62, I can argue for summer 63, but I can also argue for 64 as the turning point of the war, depending on what mood I'm in. Uh, but the difference in the North is they got all the, the foreign uh, troops or, or foreigners uh, enlisting mm-hmm. because in, um, in gaming terms and military terms, you need a three-to-one advantage to win. And the North had like a 2.5 or 2.2 advantage in the beginning. But once you get all the foreign-born troops and then the black troops coming in, that's what put them over. That You know, when you, you got to win battles, but you got to garrison the places that you win. Right, right. Uh, and the manpower difference was with the black troops and the foreigners. But if Sherman hadn't taken, um, you know, Atlanta in 64, would Lincoln have gotten reelected? So, you know, one argument is the turning point of the war is the 64 election. Because that could have gone the other way. I would, the Democrats would have done better to put a different candidate out, mm. but um, that's what what they went, and that may have shot themselves in the foot. No pun. <laughs> because McClellan McClellan was an anti-war general, you know, a, a general running on an anti-war platform just didn't make sense. There, uh, there seems to be a lot. I think a lot of historians do this, and I know a lot of the public does this, and that is that they they take the human element out of all of this stuff. You mentioned before about uh, taking uh, Culp's and Cemetery Hill at the end of July 1st. And you said, well, they were tired. And, you know, that's, that's a lot. That's, that's, you know what I mean? Like a lot of people would say, well, yeah, but you could have done this. It's like, I'm sorry. Have you been bone tired before? Have you fought in a battle? Have you marched miles and then fought in a battle in, you know, extreme heat before? And you're saying that these guys could have done it if they wanted to do it. Um, I'm starting to see that a lot more now with, with historians and also um, students of, of the war is that they demand to have these things considered. Um, and I see that in, in your book, but you, you wrote this one in the 90s, so you're kind of like a, ahead of the curve there on that. You, you're, you're very practical reasoning for various things, like, for example, the section on Reynolds' death. Is you put all the accounts there and you say, well, this one doesn't make sense, it does make sense, you know, whatever it may be. Um, I get, well, I guess yeah, well, I didn't well, really have a question. Actually, yeah, it, it's it, just an observation. Yeah, if I want to throw, well, I want to throw in there. I mean, I have a multi background, which maybe makes my writing coming in from that different angle. Okay, with the training, looking at sources as, as the classicist. But I was also a reenactor in the eighties. Okay, and I, I will admit to anybody, I learned more from one year of reenacting than from every book I ever read. 
And and is that because you're able to? I mean, you're not obviously in the same situation as them, but you're still in a situation that you're not used to or comfortable with. And you can maybe maybe you have a good enough imagination to extrapolate out. You know, what is that like? If I didn't like this one weekend because of this element and that element and that, it's got to be worse when you're going through it for real. Yeah, and I, I just to, to walk it, you know, walk a mile in my shoes, as they say. Yes, uh, and it just amazes me that you know, th- supposedly three soldiers died of disease for every one that was in a battle. The, so- the healthy ones mm-hmm. that survived all the disease- diseases line up and shoot at each other, <laughs> uh, and uh, battles are sometimes <laughs> determined on on. <laughs> so I just, oh, well, that's what happened. Right? No, I know. It's so, just. It's... Um, it's uh, boiling it down, and it's pretty good. Uh, that, you know, what officers happened to be there that day, mm-hmm. uh, or what, what did Lee really have a heart attack, you know, a week before Gettysburg? Mm. Is that why he wasn't out checking out where his troops were on the evening of the first or morning of the second? That's why he let Longstreet get away with what Longstreet got away with, because Lee wasn't feeling good. Yeah. Uh, you know, did, did General Hill have whatever venereal disease he had, or he ate too many green apples? <laughs> I've I've been through have eating too many green apples on a green apple. But that's the it's thing. Fun. Yeah, and and we, uh, you know, I point this out a lot too because I think it's a very real thing. And that is, you know, uh, you know, talk about Lee's diarrhea that he supposedly had diarrhea, or as you say, you know, he's developing heart issues and things. That, that like you know, people think I'm trying to be funny when I bring it up, but I'm really not. I'm pointing out something that's very real that everyone should like as soon as you hear it should go oh yeah okay I could totally understand this because you know you, we've got modern creature comforts you know we've got uh, luxuries like air conditioning and all that other stuff and you can call in sick if you got a bad case of diarrhea and you can stay at home in the comfort of your bed and run to the bathroom every time you need a chance and you can shower many times as you want you can do all these things keep cool so it's not as miserable because of your air conditioning and everything Lee can't do any of that stuff He's out in the heat. He's wearing wool. He's wearing uh, long johns that probably haven't been changed in quite a while. Uh, he's riding a horse, and he's got diarrhea. That's got to be miserable. Yeah. Well, and, I mean, and we, he's, are you aware that, yeah, that yeah, go ahead. before Antietam, Lee fell off his horse yeah. and almost broke both his wrists? Yeah, he had to ride I mean, in an ambulance, oh, right? He run, he, nobody, when you're talking about who's doing what at the battle— Say Lee is in physical pain, can't ride a horse. His arms are, his wrists are beat up. It's amazing how he managed to run that battle. Yeah. Oh, oh well, uh, that's the thing is, is there's, those are very real things. Uh, and I think a lot of people, when you, when you bring it up, like the look on their face is that of like, well, why are you making excuses? Like, it's not an excuse. It's a very real thing. And yet the guy still did his job. Maybe he didn't do it great, but he still did it. And, uh, and, you know, it's like people, People have a sniffle, and their boss says, hey, you messed up on this report yesterday. It's like, well, come on, I got a cold. And it's like Lee's supposed to be able to win a battle because he has diarrhea, and that's no big deal. <laughs> you know, I, I, the, yeah. the, these are very real things that you have to take into consideration. And to me, it's remarkable that any of these people, from Lee down to the common soldier, were able to do any of the things that they do. And, you know, so I think that's the way people need to look at it is not, again, well, again, and get to, yeah, yeah, to get back to the sources, that's where you need the diaries and the letters yeah. to see what was really going on with these people, what was affecting the troops if they hadn't gotten any fresh food for three days. I mean, we just take it for granted that, you know, it's, uh, troops like the, the, um, the first New Jersey brigade marked, marched, uh, what was 38 miles in, in 36 hours or something like that. They got to the field, but they didn't have any of their rations with them. Mm. So they had, you know, um, it, just to be, exert yourself that much, because yes, it's a crisis, yet not have anything to eat. Uh, it, it's, yeah, you can just read about it, but that's why I say when you're out reenacting and you realize what that meant, everywhere they went, they walked. Yes. Lee's whole army, every point they walked, and after they lost the battle, unless you're in wounded in Imboden's uh, awful wagon train heading south, mm. you're walking back home mm-hmm. after you lost with probably some kind of wound. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, you want to talk about getting hangry. You know, everybody's, 
if people uh, go long without, you know, if they skip lunch and then by four o'clock they're talking about we need to eat soon because I'm going to get hangry. It's like these guys haven't eaten for days or maybe at most they had a cracker and you're complaining that you haven't had lunch. Yeah, you know. I mean, that, that's one thing when I'm, when I'm looking at regimental strengths of Antietam. Uh, the Confederates were pushing towards the field so hard after they captured Harper's Ferry that they're eating green corn. Mm -hmm. And you wonder why, and that the number of stragglers that came up to Antietam the day after the battle because they had dropped out through exhaustion or diarrhea. Yeah. It's like, amazing, and that's why Lee was able to stay on the field another day because all these guys were straggling in. <laughs> what a miss. Um, yeah. So – we, we we've got you've got a, a a ton of books that you've written um and so we're going to have you on uh as many times as you're willing to come on david um, <laughs> i've enjoyed this i really have well you have had trouble keeping to our topic but who cares talk with you <laughs> and uh to kick ideas around yeah um, and uh you know this is what often happens when i do i i used to do almost a lecture a month before the virus hit uh, and I miss being out with the public and kicking ideas around or, you know, being at my round table who they're now having online meetings, mm. which is just different. It's not the same in person. Hope to, hope to meet you sometime. Uh, so yeah, yeah. That's great. I'd be glad to come back. Well, yeah, come on uh, down to Gettysburg soon. And, uh, but if not, I mean, we can keep doing them over the phone. Cause like I said, you got plenty of other books. This book that we're talking about today is Gettysburg July 1st by david martin uh you can find it on amazon you said you have a few copies on amazon that you would autograph right yeah uh, if you uh order it from long street house on amazon and just say um you know ask ask for the ask for an autograph so it's got to be um, uh the seller has to be long street house so if you go and you look for the book it's yeah. got to be long street house um yeah and uh, so you can go ahead and get that there on Amazon. Uh, Long Street House has other books. You give me some of the titles of the books that Long Street has. Uh, well, we're the original publishers of Regimental Strengths and Losses at Gettysburg. Um, I was doing a series on New Jersey regiments. Uh, we did the, the, the 7th and the 14th and the 15th and Battery B and New Jersey at Gettysburg. Anyway, they're all listed on the website. And uh, um, the website is longstreethouse.com. Yeah. Okay. Uh, people can order books off of the website, right? Yep. Okay. Uh, they can get it off the website. The prices might be better on Amazon, uh, but there's different deals that are cooked up on both. You know, get order more, more than one book, get free shipping and that. So then there's different deals on both sites. All right, great. Very good. Well, like I said, we'll have you back on, talk about another book. But uh, in the meantime, David Martin, thank you very much for coming on. It was a pleasure to talk to you. Same here. I much enjoyed it. Thank you All for right. having me. You're welcome, and thank you, everybody, for listening. We'll talk to you next time. All right, David. Thanks very much. Okay.